Monica Faye Pritchett was born on February 16, 1979, in Anniston, Alabama. She was the daughter of Donald and Dorothy Pritchett and had two sisters as well as two brothers. Monica married Jeremy Rollins, her high school boyfriend, and they stayed in Heflin, Alabama. They had a stable marriage until the birth of their second son, Aaron. For reasons they never made public, the couple decided to live separately. This was despite Monica being pregnant with their third child. Monica and the boys moved into their Sugar Hill Road home in mid-2001. Jeremy Rollins still had visitation rights to visit his two sons every other weekend. Monica loved her children dearly. Dalton was six years old and Aaron two years old. She was very excited about her third son's arrival in only a few weeks. Monica planned on naming him Shane. She was a busy mom, balancing a full-time job and raising her two sons. She worked at a daycare called Kitty Castle until July 2002, when she accepted a higher-paying job at ITC Deltacom. On Friday, September 13, 2002, Monica and her sons visited her father, Donald Pritchett, after work at his home in Anniston. He had a gift for his oldest grandson, Dalton, and could finally give it to him. The gift was a foal. Dalton named it Mojave. The evening was filled with horseback riding, playing, dinner, and conversation. At 8.30 p.m., Monica and the boys headed back to their Heflin home. They planned to return later that weekend to spend more time with Monica's father and his wife. However, when the weekend passed without any further word from Monica, relatives decided to go check and make sure everything was all right. When they arrived at Monica's mobile home on Monday morning, September 16th, nothing could have prepared them for what they would find. Monica and six-year-old Dalton had been brutally slayed inside their home. It seemed as if Monica went into labor from shock during the attack. The baby was found partially delivered and not alive anymore. Two-year-old Aaron was found alive and unharmed hiding in a closet. A relative called 911. The same day of the discovery, Jeremy Rollins, Monica's ex-husband, ended his 12-hour shift at Southwire around 6 p.m. and went home. A few hours later, officers arrived at his house and told him what had happened. They asked him to come to the police station. According to officials, Jeremy Rollins was quickly ruled out as a potential suspect and was cooperative throughout the investigation. After being ruled out, Jeremy said how he felt when he learned about what happened to Monica and Dalton. It was unbelievable. There where I was at, somebody was telling you something that you just cannot believe. Early press reports indicated that Monica and Dalton had both lost their lives due to stab wounds received at some point over the weekend. Everybody pretty much knows everybody when you live in a small town, and with a population of less than 3,500 people, Heflin is one of those towns. When something as horrible as a triple slaying occurs somewhere like Heflin, it rocks the very foundation of the community especially when the victims were a young pregnant mother, her six-year-old son, and her unborn son. The crime terrified the community, and people started improving security measures on their homes and kept their kids inside. Family members described Monica as an easygoing, loving mother who was always smiling and good with kids. Debbie Clark, owner and director of Kitty Castle, said... She was just always smiling, just a good person. Her little boy, he was so precious. Funeral services were held for both Monica and Dalton on September 19, 2002 at Dryden Funeral Home Chapel. They were set to be buried at the Cedar Creek Cemetery, but prior to the burial, investigators decided they needed to collect more DNA for investigative purposes. 
On September 20, 2002, Governor Siegelman offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person who committed this terrible crime. Very few details about the slaying were made public, even years later. The Heflin Police Department kept the details confidential as an investigative technique. They believed that the perpetrator would one day mention something about the slaying that was never made public leading to an arrest. Captain Joe Neighbors of the Alabama Bureau of Investigation confirmed that DNA, fingerprints, and other evidence had been collected at the scene and were sent to the Alabama Department of Forensic Science for analysis. At the time, the department was facing serious backlog issues due to budget constraints, which created a delay in processing. In June 2014, Heflin Police Chief A.J. Benefield contacted the Attorney General Office's Cold Case Unit, and the two agencies started working together. Based on new information, they began to interview people again. They met with the State Bureau of Investigation and local prosecutors and started new discussions. Police Chief Benefield was an officer at the time of the slayings. He and his partner responded to the 911 call of the relative who found Monica and her son's bodies. When talking about the case in 2014, Benefield had this to say, So really, there were three victims. It was the worst crime scene I have ever seen. Not a day goes by that we are not talking about this or working on it in some way. It is very near to our hearts. In 2015, Benefield hinted that they were looking at someone that they have known about since 2002, but he did not elaborate further. In March 2015, the Alabama Attorney General's Office joined the investigation. Authorities periodically posted on social media asking for information on the case. Unfortunately, no useful leads came in, and the case went cold for some time. In 2021, the case was reopened by Chief McGlon and Captain Scott Bonner. They resent multiple items to forensic labs, both private and state. They continued to keep close contact with some of the family members and tried their best to provide support as much as they could. Although they could not go into specific details due to the ongoing investigation, Captain Scott Bonner said there was a suspect and evidence. There is no threat to anyone from the suspect in this case at this time. The suspect, who I cannot name yet, is in jail in another state for unrelated crimes, he said. With help from the state, grant money from Seasons of Justice, and a literal truckload of evidence, investigators were able to make an arrest more than 20 years after the crime. Lewis Landon Spivey was arrested on June 26, 2023, and charged with taking the lives of Monica, Dalton, and Shane. On June 30, 2023, Heflin Police Department made the announcement to the public. Lewis Spivey kept the sordid secret to himself until he was released from a Florida prison. He is now 39 years old and was 18 years old when he committed that horrendous crime in 2002. They were acquaintances, Captain Bonner said in a press conference. They had a relationship. Bonner did not reveal a motive or the circumstances leading up to the slayings. For the last 15 years, Louis Spivey has been sitting in a Florida prison cell for an unrelated robbery and aggravated assault case out of Bay County, for which he was sentenced in February 2010. Captain Bonner and Chief McGlon took Louis Spivey into custody after his release from the Florida prison. Captain Bonner explained, Louis Spivey has since cooperated with the investigation. He was looked at early on in the investigation by other agencies before we opened up the case. Good investigation work gave us some good leads. We did not have surveillance, pictures, or cameras, said Bonner. We did not have the things that you would have nowadays. 
When investigators sat down with Louis Spivey, he allegedly gave them a complete confession, outlined the crime, and took sole responsibility for the slayings. A bond hearing was held on June 29, 2023. The court determined that the criteria for invoking Anaya's law had been met, leading to Louis Spivey's continued pre-trial confinement without the possibility of bond. Anaya's Law is a legislation named after Anaya Blanchard, a college student whose life was tragically taken in 2019. The law aims to enhance penalties for certain violent offenses in Alabama. It allows judges to deny bail or parole for individuals charged with certain violent crimes, ensuring that they remain in custody throughout their trial process. The law seeks to prioritize public safety and protect potential victims by keeping individuals considered dangerous off the streets during legal proceedings. Investigators gave few details on what led to the break in the case, but we do know about the confession and that the department was given a grant for DNA analysis, and several items were processed by a state lab and private labs in Canada. In a statement on behalf of Mayor Robbie Brown, Chief Ross McGlawn offered his condolences to the family of Monica and Dalton. Hopefully, this will bring you some sense of closure to this awful chapter in your lives. We would like to extend our deepest gratitude and appreciation to Captain Bonner, the Heflin Police Department, and all the other agencies and individuals who displayed unwavering dedication and determination in their pursuit of justice for Monica, Dalton, and their grieving family. It was definitely the hardest case, and I have worked several similar cases in my career, explained investigator and Captain Scott Bonner. The box of reports and everything we had to go through, that alone took several months, this case proved to become personal to Bonner. He admitted he has probably spent more time with Monica and Dalton's family over the last three years than he had with his own. I have become really close to them, he said. It makes me feel great that I can give them some peace. Jeremy Rollins, Monica's ex-husband, remarried in 2011 and has twin daughters with his wife. Aaron Rollins, Monica's second son, graduated high school in 2018 and is now in his early 20s. The family still resides in Heflin. Louis Spivey was transferred to the Cleburne County Jail, where he is now being held without bail and awaiting trial. In June 1994, a 39-year-old victim reported to the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department in North Carolina that an unknown man had broken into her residence and assaulted her at knife point. Male DNA was collected from her body and tested, but DNA technology was not advanced enough at the time to identify the attacker. Additional testing of the evidence was conducted in 2018. In 2019, the forensic samples from the scene were linked to another assault in Columbia, South Carolina that took place in 2010. In 2022, detectives utilized forensic genetic genealogy to identify a person of interest. Forensic evidence was then sent to Othram, Othram scientists used forensic-grade genome sequencing to build a comprehensive genealogical profile for the unknown man. Their in-house genealogy team used a genetic genealogy search to produce investigative leads that were returned to the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. Investigators continued working the case, and their follow-up investigative efforts led to the collection of a DNA sample from a person of interest. The DNA profile for this person of interest matched the DNA profiles for the unknown subject that were recovered from the 1994 and 2010 assaults. 
As a result of years of extensive forensic testing and evidence examination, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department's Crime Lab and Cold Case Unit identified the suspect as James Wayne Ingersoll. He was born on November 6, 1972. In May 2023, members of the police department's Violent Criminal Apprehension Team located and apprehended Ingersoll in Concord, North Carolina. South Carolina Law Enforcement Division and the Columbia Police Department also assisted. The victims have been notified of the arrest. The investigation into this case is active and ongoing. As additional information develops, it will be released by the CMPD's Public Affairs Office. Anyone with information about this incident is asked to call 704-432-TIPS and speak directly to a detective. The public can also leave information anonymously by contacting Crime Stoppers at 704-334-1600. Investigators want to know if James Wayne Ingersoll could be responsible for any other crimes. Destiny Renee Pittman was born in Kokomo, Indiana on January 9, 1992 to parents Melvin Douglas and Carla Pittman McCombs. Destiny was one of five children and had two brothers and two sisters. In 2013, at the age of 21, Destiny was staying with her two young children, her boyfriend, a female roommate, and three dogs in 815 James Drive, Kokomo. On the evening of February 7, 2013, two armed intruders forced their way into Destiny's home. Destiny stepped out from her bedroom into the hallway to confront the intruders. She was then fatally shot by one of the attackers. The bullet went through her chest and struck a wall at the end of the hall. Renee's boyfriend, roommate, children, and dogs were at home at the time, but hid away out of fear and were unharmed. At approximately 9.33 p.m., officers from the Kokomo Police Department were dispatched to 815 James Drive when they were notified about shots being fired at the residence. When officers arrived at the crime scene, Destiny was already gone and there was nothing they could do to revive her. A single 40 caliber shell casing was recovered. Neither her boyfriend, whose name was never disclosed, or roommate saw the intruders and could thus not give investigators any description. It was suspected that the perpetrators may have been looking to rob Destiny and her boyfriend of marijuana and cash they had from selling weed. Destiny's boyfriend reportedly admitted to police that he sold marijuana and had taken a bag containing weed and over $2,000 in cash to another house just days prior to the home invasion. Both the boyfriend and the roommate also admitted to police that Destiny, too, was involved in selling, but had not as much since she inherited money. Unfortunately, investigators were unable to identify the attackers, and the case went cold. For more than 10 years, Destiny's case remained unsolved without a single suspect ever being identified. Destiny's demise left her surviving family and friends devastated. Even years after, her mom stayed depressed and cried a lot. I hope and pray to God someone will have something to say, she said. My life has turned absolutely upside down. They took my child for no reason. Whoever it was, I hope they are satisfied. They did not get anything out of it. She was just getting ready to start modeling and have a life for herself. Her mother said not knowing who did this to her daughter or why eats at her each and every day. On March 2, 2023, two men were finally identified as suspects in Destiny Pittman's case. 
investigators announced the arrest of 32-year-old Joey McCartney and 36-year-old Jesse McCartney. Joey McCartney was taken into custody by U.S. Marshals at the crack of dawn at a residence in Graham, Kentucky. Jesse McCartney was arrested by U.S. Marshals and local police roughly two hours later at a residence in Kokomo. Graham and Kokomo are more than a four-hour drive apart. As a result of the continued investigation since 2013, Along with citizens continuing to provide leads, investigators with the Criminal Investigation Section were able to determine that these two individuals were responsible for what happened to Destiny. On December 5, 2022, a woman called in and claimed to have information about Destiny's case. She told police she could not keep this information to herself anymore after repeatedly seeing press releases on the case over the years. According to the court documents, this informant claimed to have been with Jesse McCartney on the night Destiny's life was ended and had been sitting in his white Jeep Cherokee outside Destiny's home. According to the informant, Jesse and Joey said they were running an errand, which the individual reportedly believed meant a deal that involved illegal substances. Jesse reportedly told the informant to stay inside the vehicle while he proceeded to put on black leather gloves and grabbed his handgun. Joey McCartney met Jesse at Destiny's front door before the pair entered the residence. The two of them then started searching the home which police believe it was for substances that Destiny and her boyfriend were selling. The informant heard a gunshot, and so both men come running out of the house. Jesse was sweating heavily and had a large bag of marijuana and cash in his hand, according to the informant. She alleges that she and Jesse drove back to his apartment and Joey joined them. She said Jesse then made her drive back by the home the next day. When they drove past, there was police tape surrounding the house. The informant also told police about Jesse McCartney changing his phone number and said he still lived in Kokomo on Monroe Street. She said he sold his gun and Jeep six months later after the crime was committed. The woman told investigators she did not come forward sooner because she was scared and still is. She had an alleged history with Jesse. Police showed Destiny's boyfriend photographs of Joey and Jesse McCartney after the new revelations. The boyfriend stated that Joey looked familiar and might have visited before with a common friend, but it was still unclear to investigators whether Destiny knew the McCartneys. The two men each faced charges for taking Destiny's life as well as burglary. Jesse McCartney faced additional charges of robbery and possession of illegal substances. The brothers were held without bond for the alleged connection to the case, with their hearing taking place in March 2023. Jesse McCartney's trial took place on August 11, 2023, and he was acquitted of some of the charges against him since it was determined he was not the one that shot Destiny. Joey McCartney's trial is yet to take place. 